Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. And uh, we want to say Happy Veterans Day because we know that there are people who have fought the war for us. And thank you so much for serving. And we're going to get into the Word of God now. And uh, we're looking at Mark chapter 10, verse 17 down. And the title is God and Mammon. And uh, that's not a strange title, and it is not uh, an unfamiliar title with many. Well, let's look at the, what, the, what the Word says. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud your neighbor. And, and it says, honor your father and your mother. And then he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus behold him, beholding him loved him. He's loving him. And said unto him, One thing you do lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross, and follow me. Then he was sad at the saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Well, when we look at this here, the challenge by Jesus Christ is the commandment but let's go first because we want to see that this man came running and kneeling and the first thing we have to understand is that when men are desperate even though they may possess many things they want to understand something more than what they have and at that point is when they run to the creator or to try to find an answer and jesus said to him why do you call me good there is only one good here actually is hitting the very first chapter of Genesis. You can always go back to the first chapter because it says that all that God created, he saw that it was good, and the word tab is good. Now, what's interesting about the word tab, we see it in the ninth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it represents uh, something that is internally good or the potential of something good, and actually, it gives us the picture of a woman that is pregnant. Because something good is in the woman. We see that God has put something good in the woman because she is the mother of the living, the Bible tells us. And so it actually represents something pregnant because something good is going to come out after the nine months or so. And we know that a human or uh, even animals are born, but we know that it represents something inside that is good, something to conceive or something that was conceived. And so here he says, why do you call me good? If you know that there is only one good, well, how did the man know that? Because he understood something about the commandments, and we're going to get to this. Remember that all religion, all religions will always recognize God is greater than all, and even admit that the Creator is good, and He does good. And so here, the very first chapter of Genesis, we can see that God is good. And throughout the Bible, we will see God is good and his mercy endures forever. His goodness is connected to his mercy. I, I, I think I start that off every Sunday before I lead the worship because it just comes out of my mouth. God is good and his mercy endures forever. Sometimes I'll say his mercy endures for a little while and everybody will say no forever. And I just want to see if you're listening. So he says, you know the commandments. Now, how did he know the commandments? Well, we're going to see. He says, do not commit adultery. Now, committing adultery is the seventh commandment. He says, do not kill. That's the sixth commandment. He says, do not steal. That's the eighth commandment. Do not bear false witness. That is the ninth commandment. Do not defraud, which is the, the tenth commandment, meaning do not cover it. And honor your mother and your father. This is the fifth covenant. Now, look what he says. Because he says, I have observed these things. But watch this. The laws of God are written in the heart of all men. There is not one person born in this world, a human, that does not have the law of God in their heart. And you may say, how is that? How can a murderer have 
or a person that steals or commits adultery have the law of God in their heart because God put the law there as a witness to their crimes. That even though you don't read the law, the law is a witness to that which is good, which is God. And even a murderer before he kills or maybe makes his first kill, in his conscience he knows that this is wrong. Now we're able to override the law of God because of our evil intentions, what is called our yet sahara. It's an evil intention. It's the very purpose why God destroyed all humanity in Genesis chapter 6 in the days of Noah because of the yet sahara, the imagination of their evil, their minds was all the time. And so you can get to a point, as the Bible says that even Paul says that in the last days, the Spirit clearly says that some will depart from the faith, giving heed to doctrines of demons, being seducted by these spirits, by their words, by their teachings. And, they, he, and listen, and Satan's going to do it, curse him. He's going to do it through the hands, the feet, the eyes he's, the, of, of men who do not know God or do not want to know God, yet the law of God is in their hearts. Watch this now. How can a person produce false doctrine if he doesn't have some truth? Before a person begins to lie to themselves, the truth is already bearing witness in their heart. And this young man understood something because he had at least six commandments of the law of God. And this is the Ten Commandments, by the way, folks. Some people say, well, you're not saved by the law the Ten Commandments. I go, well, no, you're not. You can't get saved by the law by itself. No, you cannot. But when you're saved, tell me, being saved, do you want to break these commandments? It should be the desire of every child of God to say, I don't want to sin against God. Matter of fact, we know because Christ was sinless, we can learn to sing sin less. Mm -hmm. The laws of God are written in the heart of men so some will, watch this, some will give more cl closer attention to it than others, but knowing the law is not enough. The questions about that which God has written must be examined in a deeper way. And then he says, and he answered, and he answered Jesus and said, Master, all of these I have observed from youth. So we understand that this young man must be a Jew, or he was a Hebrew, but he was someone who understood and grew up and even follow these commandments. So Jesus quoted these commandments knowing that the man had special privileges in the sense of saying, I know what you've been observing. I know what you've been learned. I know what you've been doing. So maybe he had a connection with this young man somewhere. Maybe he met him somewhere. We don't know. The scripture does not say. But the way he is speaking to him, he understands something about this young man enough to quote the commandments that he was keeping. And although this man may meet some of the standards of God's law, he must examine a deeper part of the commitment to the first commandment. And this is where Christ hits him. This is where Christ hits him. He says that if you want to go into, if you want to have treasures in heaven, sell everything that you have, give to the poor, carry, pick up your cross and follow me. Now, Matthew 19 also speaks of this, but Mark, he gives a deeper impression of the things that are being said because they believe that Mark is the one that ran away when, um, <clears throat> When uh, Jesus got arrested, they said there was a young man who came clothed just in linen, and they grabbed the linen and he ran away. So some believe that that was Mark. And why not? So that's a, that's a, uh, that's a belief. Now they also believe that the upper room also belonged to the house of Mark. Whatever it is, this young man Mark, who truly is the cousin of Peter, that's where he got his gospel Peter must have gave him other, other things to think about. But whatever it is, this young man that he's speaking about says that he has kept the commandments which Jesus quoted. And now Jesus tells him to sell everything he has if you want treasure in heaven. To give to the poor if you want to have treasures in heaven. Pick up your cross and follow me if you want to have treasures in heaven. And watch this. I love this. Although this man met some, some of the standards of God's law, he must have had to examine a deeper part of it when this was said 
And he could have added the command. Listen, the Savior could have added and quoted other commandments, but he stopped there for a reason. Then Jesus, beholding and loving him, said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, listen, and you will have treasures in heaven, and take up your cross. Come, take up your cross and follow me. Here, the good teacher hits the heart of the matter. Notice, you called me good. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. He recognized something about Jesus that he did not see in other men. He understood that Jesus was a higher priority, that Jesus had a higher authority than all the men of the land, and he called him good teacher. There were a lot of teachers <clears throat> in the land. Nicodemus, you know, was a, a good teacher. He was a teacher of Israel. And by the way, after Jesus dealt with him, Nicodemus got saved and Joseph of Arimathea, because the council asked Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus to go and search out this Jesus, and they did. <laughs> You better not say that to people and not expect them to get saved. They got saved. We know that because they defiled themselves according to the law by taking a dead body in their hands, Christ, and they put him into the grave. They prepared him. Now, you're not defiled, on, you know, in a way that is, uh, it, it, it affects your, your position, you know, as a Jew. And, and No, it's just defiled for the day, 24 hours probably, probably at the most. But they took the body of Jesus down and they knew what they had to do with it. They put him in the grave. But thank God, Jesus was raised from the grave. And he says this, although he kept some of the law, he failed at the most important one that proves to show him that he was a slavery to his possessions and he was imprisoned by his own wealth. Jesus Christ, without saying it, hits the point of the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shall have no other God before me. And if you want to go to the second one, he says, Thou shall make no image up for yourself of anything that is in the heaven and, the earth, and on the earth and under the earth. So understand that here the good teacher points him to the ultimate good. And when he showed him this, the young man knew that he was talking about the first commandment and he was smitten with conviction. And the Bible says that he turned away. He turned away. And he was deeply grieved because he had a lot of possessions. Folks, the Bible says, Jesus said, thank you. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. But yet we know in the Old Testament, God gave riches to, to his saints. He gave riches to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. They were rich. They were well. They were well off. And Job was well off. And a lot of others were well off. But their hearts were not in their possessions. It is one thing when you want to be possessed by God. And it's, other things, and it's another thing when you are possessed by the things that God make. We're not supposed to worship the creation that is what is called one one ism or one ism or the universal uh, doctrine of God, meaning that we are one with creation, you know. And a lot of movies are actually showing us this right now. It's, and it's, it's well, it's been for a long time. It's always been cultish. So they, they they try to take us away from the riches of understanding who God is and His law and His word to take us and to be um, become one with nature, folks. That is universalism or pantheism, many gods. But the Bible tells us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. The Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And Jesus says, The second is like the first. And loving your neighbor as yourself. And I told you that a lot of people say, oh, I, 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 I observe both. I love God with all my heart and I love my neighbor. Until you read the laws of God and find out that maybe I was not loving God the way he want me to love God. Mm. Maybe I'm not loving my neighbor the way he wants me to love my neighbor. We have to learn to do that. I have to learn things about my wife, even though we've been together for over three decades. I know, wow, well, we've been together a long time, babe. And I still, I still know 
uh, have to know things that she likes. I know she likes waffles and eggs. <laughs> I'm going to have to prepare that this morning. <laughs> Do you like waffles and eggs? As long as it doesn't become your God. That's, you know, food can become our God sometimes. Mm. I had to learn that. That's why I'm trying to lose weight and keep myself, you know, in shape. That's not it. That, that was a freebie, folks, okay? This way, you know. There is nothing wrong with having great possessions that, that is until the possessions become our stronghold. That's when we have to say, that's enough. When the Lord's voice speaks, it opens the understanding of the law. The heart is pricked because of conviction. Here is the moment when people must make a decision based on the grace that is seen and experienced in that moment. That is when people say, what must I do? As, as when Peter preached that first sermon in the book of Acts. Oh, hallelujah. He was preaching up a storm to the point. And for mine, you had to be filled with the Holy Spirit first because they were in the upper room praying. They got filled and people mistaken their being filled because as they spoke in tongues, they spoke in the tongues of other men glorifying God. They said, these people are drunk and Peter stands up. <laughs> the one that always used to speak, just speak out of turn or say something stupid or say something trying to be spiritual. But this time he stood up by the Spirit of God. From this time forth, he never said anything stupid again. Hallelujah. How many know when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> you think about what you're going to say? <clears throat> as long as this book is in your mouth, as long as this book is the message that you speak, you will never fail. As long as this book is what you're standing on, you will never fall. As long as this book is in your mind and in your heart, your mind can be cleansed, your heart can be cleansed, just as Jesus who said in John chapter 15, verse 3, when he told the disciples, you are already clean because of the word that I spoke to you. Hallelujah. And by the way, it's Torah, the word, the Torah I spoke to you. And it's here at the height of all things that the first commandment speaks to the matter of the, of the heart. It comes to the forefront. And here the battle begins. Here the battle is exposed in the heart. And he went away very sad because he had a lot of possessions. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot have them both. One will be ruler over the other. And I say to you this morning, search your heart. See where you're standing. Are you running after the treasures of this world so much to the point that you have forgotten the very simplicity of the first commandment? Thou shalt not love any other thing except God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out, up, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I am the Lord your God. This is beautifully illustrated, and I close at the very seashore of the resurrection when the, the disciples were depressed, they didn't, know what, they didn't know what to do, and they went back to fishing, and they were hanging out, and all night they caught nothing. And Jesus in the morning at that resurrection stands at the seashore, and he tells them, he says, friend, he shouts out, friend, have you caught anything? No, we've been working all night, we haven't caught anything. He says, throw your, nets on, throw your net on the right side of the boat. And they did so, and they caught a large amount of fish. But this is what's interesting. Peter, Peter, he heard something from one of the disciples. disciples one of the disciples recognized, and he said, it is the Lord. And Peter jumped into the water. And he swam to the shore before everybody else. And can you picture him coming out of that water? tired, breathing hard, standing before Jesus with his eyes looking down in the ground, ashamed because he had denied the Lord, standing there wet, and finally looking into his eyes. And the disciples by that time came in, they brought the fish in, and they began to count the fish. They were concerned about the fish. The Lord was standing there. They were concerned about the fish, but that's okay. Jesus had a plan, and they counted the fish, and they caught 153 fish. And let me tell you what 153 signifies in the letters in the law of God. I am Adonai. I am Adonai. Jesus stood there and said, I am the Lord Adonai. 
And from that time forth, they served the Lord and they forgot about the fish. They forgot about everything else. They did not serve mammon. They served the Lord their God. God bless you. Have a wonderful, spiritual day. And remember, no matter how many fish you catch in this world, always give the glory to God because he is the Lord your God.